There literally are millions of unfilled and unfillable roles in digital jobs because the workers just aren't there. Those companies and those nations that fail to procure the right high skill digital talent will fail. 50% of the Fortune 500 no longer exists, largely due to uh, digital transformation or failing there. Companies like BlackBerry, Kodak, Blockbuster, and others. Welcome everyone to an interesting episode of WorkPod, Work 2.0 show. Today we have with us Gabe Del Porto. Um, he's a chief uh, uh, executive officer at Udacity. And for um, people who don't know Udacity, it is one of a interesting platform to educate uh, masses through online training. And obviously, Gabe will, will sort of dive deeper into the specifics. Uh, Gabe, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me. So by training, you are a nuclear engineer. How that roadmap to running Udacity, if you can walk us through your journey? Well, I think in a lot of ways, I'm the poster child for um, career transition and uh, the ability for humans to learn radically different skills over time. And so I started off as a nuclear engineer and um, worked in that industry for a couple of years, enjoyed it, um, but ultimately wanted to have a bigger impact on the world on a more strategic level. So I, I moved into strategy consulting. And became, uh, you know, a strategy consultant. Got to uh, actually advise, you know, Fortune 500 CEOs uh, on their business strategy at a very young age. It was really uh, fascinating. And then, you know, I got a call from a recruiter one day saying, "Hey, do you want to, uh, you know, join a marketing team?" And I said, "Boy, I don't know anything about marketing." And <laughs> I jumped into marketing and uh, rose up through the ranks and became a chief marketing officer. Um, and then one, you know, one day uh, uh, I was working at Lending Tree and was talking with the CEO and um, he asked me to be the president. And I'm like, OK, great. I don't know anything about that, but let me work this out and was able to, uh, in a pretty short order, um, help uh, the company reformulate their entire corporate strategy, uh, start to stand up a whole bunch of new lines of businesses um, and uh, really accelerate their growth. And then got a call from same CEO, Doug, who really believed in me and I got to give him tons of credit and said, hey, do you want to be a CFO? And I said, I, I don't know anything about being a CFO, but let me think about that. Let me break it down and understand like where the, you know, where the things I need to be able to do. And I uh, kind of system, systematically went about it and, um, uh, and ultimately uh, figure out what I could uniquely do in that role to transform the business and use that to raise a bunch of capital, uh, acquire some companies that align with our strategy and um, accelerate inorganic growth. So when I got the call uh, from Udacity, I had you know, played all these crazy different roles throughout my career, but had started really thinking a lot about personally how I can be, uh, give back to the world, how I could actually make a um, step change impact on human welfare. And so that had led me, uh, before I talked to Udacity, down the path of like, how do you reskill uh, populations so they can participate in the digital age? So they can pivot from maybe backwards looking careers into forward looking careers and earn more money and, um, uh, and, and be active participants in this um, uh, future forward world. And uh, so when I got the call from Udacity, like my mind share was already there. Uh, I'd already come to the conclusion that you needed to create a set of tools which looked very, very much like Udacity had already created. Um, and so I stepped into the CEO role. And again, having never been a CEO uh, was uh, definitely a stretch for me, but was able to break things down and, and really think about what is a good CEO and what do I need to learn and how do I learn that really, really quickly uh, and was able to you know, come out of this big, long career journey with a whole bunch of different, you know, functional areas of expertise and, um, and, you know, really have an impact on the world at scale. Awesome. And, and for our listeners and viewers, what is Udacity? Like, how do you, how do you define Udacity and how do you define um, what you're doing for the society? Yeah, Udacity transforms lives, businesses, and nations through radical talent transformation in the careers of the future. So what does that mean? Um, we have built programs and um, learning infrastructure that is specifically designed to be the fastest, most effective way for people to get job ready skills 
in things like uh, software development, data analytics, machine learning, product management, cloud computing, cybersecurity, autonomous systems, automation, all these areas where there literally are almost inexhaustible, uh, there's almost an inexhaustible demand uh, among employers and aren't enough people on the planet to fill those roles. So uh, we can help people get into those roles. We can work with enterprises to reskill their existing uh, employee base so they can be deployed in things like cloud or machine learning uh, and to work with nations to literally build out uh, technology capabilities and build out parts of their economy that just didn't uh, exist before. Uh, and thank you for, for walking us through that. So what has been, uh, I think you are a great testament on the kind of role you jumped, right? So see, there was a CMO somewhere, there's a nuclear engineer somewhere, <laughs> there there is a, a lending tree CFO somewhere, and then there's a CEO of a, a tech company. So uh, I think um, what, what has been y- um, your recipe of success in delivering on those roles as, and, and you, you achieved uh, some interesting milestones along the way as well. So what, what has been some of, some of, some of your um, mantra, so as to speak, uh, on what helped you transition effectively and, and keep on growing to, to these radically different roles? So I think there's a, when you think of moving into a new role, there's a couple of different dimensions. The first dimension is um, how do I become technically proficient in that role? So what does it take to be an effective strategy consultant? What does it take to be an effective marketer? What does it take to be an effective uh, um, finance person or CFO? Or what is it, you know, for other people, it might be, what does it take to be an effective data analyst? Um and so I always took a, an engineering mindset to this was let's let's define what the role is and then let me break it down into its pieces and just problem solve. How do I get that experience and capability? How do I get that experience and capability and just be super deliberate about it? And by doing that, I was able to when I moved into strategy consulting, I knew nothing about it. I got promoted in nine months When I moved into marketing. I got promoted, I think, in four or five months. Right. And having moved into those roles, you know, a complete neophyte, but taking that, you know, a systematic approach uh, was pretty effective. Um, That said, it's not just about the technical proficiency, right? Like is there's a lot of other things that go around being successful in, um, in an organization. So I think it's this notion of constantly looking for your weaknesses and figuring out how to develop in those areas. And um, so when I was, uh, in, you know, back in financial services in the mid 2000s, I kind of risen a bit in my career and I got to the point where it was no longer sufficient to be good at your job, to be effective in the organization. You actually had to be really good at developing peer relationships, working with others. And um, and so, I, you know, I did this you know, leadership survey and, you know, I got 360 review for my boss and for my subordinates and my peers. And, you know, what I learned from that is my boss really liked me. My peers really liked me. My peer, my, uh, or my subordinates liked me. My peers were sitting there going, who is this guy? Like, you know, he's just going off and doing stuff. He's not partnering with us. And so I actually had to learn a completely different skill set, which was how do you develop relationships um, how do you bring other people along in the journey and and, and build um, you know allies to that process? So I think when you think about your career, there's the functional stuff, and you can you can make pivots pretty quickly and easily if you just break it down you know into this elemental uh, parts. But it's always this this curiosity and wanting to understand what do I need to be at this point in my career to be effective beyond just the te- uh, technical piece. Interesting. And and um, I think um, one thing that I was really excited about this conversation, I think one thing um, uh, that I found really interesting about your profile. So uh, you have been um, working in, 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 in an era of transformation. So if, if, we, if we look at last 20 years, there was a talk around SIP phones, then there was a talk around cloud, then there was an on-prem, then there was a like, and, and now AI, cloud and, and apps. So we have we have gone through a bunch of those cycles in the last twenty years. Now, having considering yourself out of Udacity, like when you were before before Udacity happened, all these platforms were emerging, right? And and uh, so fr- from your vantage point, what what do you think has how um, 
the retraining effort or or, or educating effort for for the companies as has happened for last 20 20 years taking udacity out of this equation like just your perspective so um outside of udacity we are going through businesses and nations are facing the most radical shift in skills needed to succeed in the history of the world uh over the next five years hundreds of millions of jobs of the past will be eliminated due to ai ml and automation and at the same time hundreds of millions of digital jobs of the future will be created due to the same factors the challenges businesses face is that 82 percent of the global 2000 self-admit to having a major skills gap in things like cloud cybersecurity, ai ml data analytics things like that and 70 percent say it's preventing innovation and they're, as a result, they're spending $1.8 trillion this year on digital transformation efforts, but a majority of those projects will fail primarily due to lack of talent. So we are, we are in, an, in an era unlike any other era, era in the history of the world where the pace of innovation has accelerated to unbelievable um, speed and also the traditional companies that exist across uh, the country can't staff their projects to keep up. They can't staff their projects to uh, to innovate. There's simply not enough people on the planet. And historically, they have relied on the university system to you know, graduate people and to bring them along slowly. Um, and that no longer works. The half-life of a skill today is four to five years. The, the, you know, a university degree is four to five years mm -hmm. and $200,000. By the time you graduate with, from, uh, from university with that degree, like a lot of your skills are already going to be obsolete. So the existing infrastructure just does not support where we are as, uh, um, as a world. Now we think about this as what we call a, you know, it is a 100% solvable problem. And we call the solution radical talent transformation, right? Is you're not going to solve your problems by sending your employees to university or even trying to hire. Uh, out of university. You're not going to solve your problems by, you know, making an online learning platform available and hoping for the best. It starts with making talent transformation a major initiative of the scale of your digital transformation efforts, because it's the people piece that's missing. It's not the technology piece that's missing. It requires organizations understanding the skills they're going to need, but more importantly, understand the, uh, understanding the skills that exist within their uh, workforce, which by and large organizations don't understand mapping which workers can reasonably in cohorts uh, achieve what skills uh, needs, and then taking a really programmatic approach to developing those skills, which will include something like a uh, uh, Udacity. We actually have uh, an enterprise grade solution that takes you through every one of these steps together. And it's not just about, you know, videos or project based learning, there's all of which we have, right, but it's, it's the the planning and the program management and the strategy and the infrastructure that goes around it. That, uh, that make these things successful. So for the first time in history, enterprises and nations are going to have to deal with rapid reskilling themselves and not rely on a university system that is not fit for purpose. Interesting. And and um, what has been um, e Udacity's journey been? Like what has, what has uh, Udacity seen uh, in the past to present, how has the, the world of um, retraining or relearning has evolved? If you can walk us through, um, what has been the journey like? Yeah, I mean, with all innovations, you know, it starts with a, uh, you know, a great story. So uh, Yudasi's founder, Sebastian Thrun, was um, teaching a graduate level AI course uh, at Stanford. And uh, he decided in 2011 to put it online. And uh, Stanford wasn't very happy about this, but he went ahead and did it. Uh, he got 160,000 enrollees in this graduate level Stanford AI course. Um, 23,000 of them graduated the entire Stanford course, like you know the same test the Stanford mm -hmm. students were going through. And the number one Stanford student scored number 413 in the class. It was a giant epiphany moment of, boy, you don't like have to be the best of the best student at the most elite university to do some really sophisticated stuff. Now that was the birth story, but since then, like we realized, you know, very quickly that, um, you know, to get real employable job skills, you're not going to get there from a university curriculum. It's just not set up to do that. 
right? You need to actually take a completely different approach. You need to start with an employable job resume and work backwards. You need to build it so that you're to complete the programs, you actually have to do the job. So to complete a nano degree in, um, as a self-driving car engineer, as an example, you have to upload your code into Udacity a self-driving car and using your code, it drives around a core, stops and red, goes on green, and doesn't hit stuff, right? It's that level of skills. You're designing to deliver that level of skills. And in terms of creating the actual video content that supports that, we're going out to industry and partnering with people like Waymo uh, and Mercedes and BMW and others who are on the forefront of these technologies and create the curriculum around the state of the art and the people actually deploying the technologies, not a university curriculum that hasn't changed um, uh, in, in a decade. So when we think about where we are today versus where we started in those humble uh, early days, you know, we, we took that first innovation um, and that insight and really pivoted to understanding how do you create a super custom built differentiated solution that achieves what you want to achieve, which is different from what the university system uh, was doing. And what we've done from that point is, um, is move from maybe a consumer oriented model to an enterprise and national government oriented model. Um, the, the enterprise space is going through massive transformation right now. They're struggling. The pains are immense. CEOs rank uh, lack of talent as their number one business risk today. Uh, and so we've built our platform and our program management around uh, that you know, concept of Udacity Nano Degree to serve enterprises and to serve nations trying to accomplish the same thing, which is building um, uh, tech economies in their national footprint. I think um, so. Um, these are some profound visions, I think. So when you when you say uh, government models and, and nations uh, uh, needing to be served through these technologies, I think um, as a technologist, I couldn't uh, agree more. I think that's that's definitely. Um, I'm curious as as so as a technologist, you understand. I think you talked about half life of a skill. I think that's that's a pretty pretty relevant um, uh, uh, conversation. So if if you are an entrepreneur and and if if I tell you my personal story, I had this constant ruffle with my university local here that if I am getting your talent after master's degree. And then I have to spend another two years or one year retraining that that gentleman or gentlewoman uh, to to attune to what I'm what problem I'm I'm facing as a business today, vis a vis getting a high schooler and just maybe spending another six months over it, and they'll be able to perform hopefully if not better at par uh, to to your why would I pay premium and then why the so from your vantage point what is the future of universities in this new reality because this is a, some serious pain that you're talking about. Well, you know, I don't think the university system is going away, but I think that they have forgotten their mission. And, um, you know, universities have always done a pretty good job of teaching you how to be an adult and um, developing some good critical thinking skills. Uh, they have, by and large, forgotten that they're here to serve the student. Uh, and the reason I say that is the cost of a university degree has tripled. Um, and the service that they have delivered has not changed one bit in 40 to 50 years. And can you imagine any product in the world today that hasn't changed for 40 to 50 years, but you could triple the price? I can't. Um, so I think the university system is, I mean, it's obviously here to stay, but it, it is, it is somewhat broken. Um, and, uh, and it isn't focused on delivering, you know, state-of-the-art future forward skills. So, you know, most people coming out of university don't necessarily have specific skill sets. Uh, so what we need right now to deal with the hundreds of millions of people who are going to have to make this pivot from, you know, old school jobs to new school jobs is just something that recognizes the half-life of a skill is, you know, four to five years. And it's not a one and done. You know, you're going to have to, uh, you know, four, five, six times in your career now go through some sort of, you um, of reskilling or retraining or um, or learning, you know, a new job, um, and uh, and so you need programs that are custom built for that task. The other thing, when you talk about high schoolers, which is super true, and it really gets into like diversity and inclusion, seventy five percent of the people are never going to complete a four year degree, right? So the university is is 
serving that relatively elite group, what about the other 75% of us, right? How can we make sure that those people have an opportunity to participate in uh, the tech economy? And I will tell you that uh, we work with an organization called 110 and, and their mission and their vision is spectacular. They, their mission is to train 1 million black individuals who don't have a four-year degree in future forward careers and get them 1 million jobs, right? Think about the, the audacity of that. And we are uh, their training partner to actually deploy these skills. Um, there are so many opportunities. 3% of workers in Silicon Valley, the top 75 Silicon Valley tech companies are black. 13% of employees in the United States are black. Like that's just fundamentally wrong. And you're not going to get there on a university system, right? You need to actually find other ways to connect with these, uh, these populations that have been um, underrepresented and get them the skills they need to participate in this, uh, this economy. So lots of work to do there. But I think the key is finding the right solution that is custom built for task. Interesting. I think uh, when you were pitching that, so I think one one thought that came to my came to my mind was so at one point we were um, on the mission to democratize analytics. So we were doing uh, these classrooms all over the all over the U.S. And one thing really took our took our uh, attention. So one guy in uh, I think it's Milwaukee, and he said, "Vishal, you guys are a East West phenomena." I said, "What do you mean by that?" Right. So he said, you just hippies, either East or West, you come and then you talk about this radical idea that we can't relate with. Right. So then that sort of opens my uh, and, and we call it opportunity d- deserts. Right. Because these because of their geoloco, they don't have our university access or educational access. So we have this ed- opportunity deserts all around the U.S. where you have full functioning brain, which are cognitively super healthy. They can perform rocket science level task but they don't they are not equipped that ways so i think when you talk about diversity and and delivering on that promise um, what has what has been what has been your observation as a, as a technology provider to enable uh, uh, or hopefully solve that uh, opportunity desert problem for for the re- retraining of the workforce problem so there's a let me unpack that a little bit there's a, there's a lot of really interesting things happening today that um and, and, you know, for better or worse, COVID is driving this, uh, yeah. that will change the dynamic that you're talking about. So what COVID taught the world is that you can effectively work remotely anywhere, you know, in the country. You don't all have to be in San Francisco. You don't all have to be in New York. Um, up until this point in the world, you know, if you lived where I grew up in West Virginia, you had no opportunity to work for one of these yeah. tech companies. Uh, The thing that drives me crazy is that the population density of geniuses in West Virginia is the same as it is in Silicon Valley, more or less. But the opportunities are Mm. vastly different. The earning potential is crazy different. And what COVID has done is actually broken down that opportunity barrier. And so now if you take someone from West Virginia who probably has a, you know, genius IQ, but is working in for $13 an hour at Walmart, like you can take those people get them the skills they need and get them on their path to working at one of these tech companies because the tech companies just want talent. They're dying for talent, right? And they can be anywhere. So uh, we will be launching a program actually in West Virginia to do this and to prove it out in kind of that Appalachia region. region. But if I take a parallel to the work we do in Egypt, you can see this happening already. So Egypt came to us and said, we want to create the number five tech freelancing economy on the planet from a standing start. Our university system can't support that. Can you help us develop these skills? And uh, we took that challenge and have been uh, working with them actually since 2017, but uh, in at scale since uh, 2020 and have uh, enrolled over 200,000 students, have graduated over 60,000 students. And we're literally measuring our impact on uh, Egypt's GDP growth. And they're getting a 10x return every dollar on uh, training in Udacity, they spend, they get 20X in GDP, right? And, we're, and we basically have designed these programs around uh, freelancing. And so we connect the students, we actually train them on not just the tech skills, but then how to be a freelancer and then connect them to the freelancing platforms and it's working. And so now you have people that may not have a local tech employer who are deploying tech skills, earning good wages, and um, starting to become part of this digital economy. So it's completely doable at scale. Um, The US is 
really behind this. If you look at other countries around the world, they are leaning in heavily and realizing that, you know, the university system is not a panacea. You need other solutions. You need to connect with the, the rest of the population, not just this elite population. And it's working. And we are working with those nations. And the U.S. is way behind. Right. Our systems, there's just very little political appetite to do anything different. It's so calcified, um, but it works. And so um, it's uh, I hear you on the East West thinking thing, but it doesn't have to be and it shouldn't be. And COVID, for better or worse, changed the world in a way that was actually really positive for the rest of the country. Interesting. So um, from from your vantage point. Um, so I totally agree with you. I'm totally on board that co- that pandemic has given sort of uh, flexes the muscle a bit, right? We are now stuck. So there is no other option besides just opening a laptop and just looking at the camera. Um, now sort of as we are opening up, so from, because you, you, you have a pretty sweet vantage point on how the, the world is actually, because people are actually using you for, for these initiatives. So what has been your observation? How far are we to, to that uh, that that sort of progressive future where uh, you're rightly pointing out that somebody in West Virginia would have the same opportunity as a Silicon Valley uh, individual. So what do you think that are we there or, or, or do we need s- more hand pushing and sort of hand holding on there? Yeah, so I think from a, just the um, perspective of a willingness of employers to consider non-traditional backgrounds um, and non-traditional geographies, uh, you know, we're probably 70% of the way there, right? Employers have come to the re- realization that they, they just ca- like, they cannot hire from university to get the skills that they need. It just doesn't exist. There's not enough people with the skills they need in the world. And so they are, uh, very open at this point to hiring s- based on skills versus you know, specific degrees. Um, what we don't have now is the, uh, the infrastructure as a nation to uh, go out and um, and train people at that based based on you know largely government type funding program. So private enterprise just has to step up and do it themselves. States have to step up and do it themselves. And so what does this mean? If um, if you are an enterprise, instead of think about your uh, two two different areas. Three different areas, actually, right? So one is your existing assets, which is your existing talent base. How can I reskill that talent base to fill the roles I have within my company? And there's a lot of skepticism with uh, within U.S. Uh, in employers, but it works, and we've proven it, right? So we work with uh, Shell, for example, and they came to us and said, we have a, a central data science group that's serving, serving uh, 70 countries, and that just doesn't work at scale. We need to get data science skills out into the field at scale across the world. And we have an asset, which is people understand math, right? you know, geological, civil, and mechanical engineers. We need to get them trained on data science. Well, we put together a program for them, deploy that program. And now they have people all over the world with data science skills that are doing incredible things like building uh, live streaming sensor data models that can predict uh, oil rig failure two weeks in advance, get replacement parts out into the field and save $2 million per outage, right? Like that's an, like a real world example of where this really does work. So that's piece one. Piece two is instead of having a recruiting function that says, let me go find a bunch of resumes and people check my boxes or don't, you can find people who are talented, who are maybe a step or two away from checking your boxes, and then do what we call train to hire or hire to train. So train to hire would be say, hey, you're almost there. Here's a scholarship to, for example, you'd ask the an Um, Go complete this. And when you complete this, we'll hire you. Or we'll hire you and then we'll you know, send you through this training program to get you uh, up, to, up to skill. So that's piece two. And the third piece is taking a really you know, broader view around corporate social responsibility. How do you take um, your, your CSR goals and build programs to help underrepresented groups. Maybe it's minors in Appalachia, maybe it's, um, underrepresented minorities in inner city of Detroit, whatever it is, how, how do you build programs to actually get those people the skills so they can participate in the digital economy? And by the way, you get first dibs on recruiting from that population, 
right? So there's multiple different ways that enterprises should be thinking about um, tapping these talent bases, these really, really smart people that just don't have uh, currently the right skills, getting, the, the, getting them the right skills um, and getting them deployed in your business. Interesting. So if, uh, five to 10 years back, if we talk about, say, a platform like Udacity or uh, Coursera, or which, whichever platform was out there, and, yes. and you talk to businesses about um, how, are you, how, are, how, is, how are your digital assets transforming your workforce, right? So they point to their university, right? So every every company has their U and that is just a ginormous archive of a lot of content and pretty much onus is on an individual, right? So it's, yes. it's an ad, it's, it's an added bonus and I'm, I'm already overwhelmed. I'm already bored. And now I have to sort of take myself out and take this random courses that my company thinks are relevant. Now you're talking about something very, very interesting. You're talking about radical talent transformation, right? That's that's pretty, pretty, it, it basically. So from you as a technologist, um, running a technology to really empower a worker like me, what is what is your, what? so what does that even mean? So does that mean that you have the onus of edu- retraining me or you still believe that I should do the heavy lifting myself? Like what is your role as a technologist or running a technology company to retrain this this workforce? So what we have seen and observed is that if you take programs and and just publish them on a learning management system, like go back and get your master's degree in business administration or take this, you know, video course on data analytics, um, that doesn't work, right? Because your employees are busy. They have other things to do. Um, not to mention the fact the quality of those programs, you know, can mm-hmm. aren't as deep as you need to actually create talent transformation, right? So if you want to really radically transform the talent in your organization, you have to build an initiative around it. And it has to be, you know, strategic, thoughtful, and resource. And, you know, it starts with defining what you need, putting a plan. This is, this is what any enterprise would do for anything except for mm. talent because they just mm. haven't done it before. But, you know, we would define like, what are we trying to accomplish? What's our project plan to get there? How do we resource it? And how do we uh, identify our existing skill sets? Um, and then algorithmically map, here's where they are today at an individual level. And, you know, uh, maybe Susan is one step from being a data analyst and two steps from being, you know, uh, a SQL expert. And maybe, you know, Bob is, you know, one step from being a cybersecurity analyst, right? And so like understanding where they are, what the leaps are, and then programmatically going after those empl- employee groups and driving them through programs in cohorts um, and then deploying them immediately in those jobs so they can actually get uh, on the job experience. So, our clients who get the highest ROI do that. They start with what's the business need I'm trying to solve. Uh, in the case of Shell, it was like, how do I get data science skills out into the field? And let me identify the people who can be successful at that. Let me drive them through a systematic program and then get them into the field and measure the impact. If you just publish a learning platform with a bunch of videos, like you're going to get none of that. And maybe like literally some of these programs, you know, include things up to including the art of happiness and the art of happiness is fine. It's just not mission critical or aligned to your digital transformation needs. Right. And so um, I think it's just taking that really strategic outcome oriented approach and resourcing it and planning it. Interesting. And I think um, uh, when, when we talk about transformation uh, in an organization, so uh, when we talk about technology transformations or t- uh, so so there, there are two aspects of it. So one is the depth of transformation, right? So how how much expertise do we need as an as an organization around a certain skill, and what the when is the breadth of it, right? So how many of us need to be trained something like this? So yeah. um, it's uh, I think now is pretty interesting time because we are seeing a lot of technology stacks getting disrupted on their own, creating their own S curve S hype curve um, conversations, creating those disruptions, and um, so basically that, so when we talk to businesses around their retraining challenges, one of the things that we hear a lot about is, 
hey, I know that everyone needs to be AI trained, but do they really need to, right? So um, as, as a business, I understand that future is going to be AI, but if if some guy is working on a floor, uh, mechanic, uh, uh, manning a, a mechanical machine, so as, as, as a Udacity, as, as a delivery vehicle for many of these um, uh, talent capabilities to, to or, or skill capabilities retraining platform, what do you think are some of the challenges that you are seeing uh, retraining workers to to their core full uh, to deliver on this transformation? Yeah, so this is a really good point. The way to kind of think about this visually is a pyramid, right? And at, of course, you want like kind of mid pyramid. Think about that as like practitioners, people who are like building AI models. And of course, you want people building AI models, but that's going to be, you know, a, a significant subset of your organization. And the way you should think about this is at the base level, uh, you want to build awareness, like 45, 50, 60,000 people should know something in your organization, something called AI exists. Um, and here's maybe a few applications of it. And if you on the shop floor see something that looks like, boy, I think like we could deploy AI and get some sort of um, you know, step change improvement here, let me go talk to somebody, right? Who's actually going to build the model, right? This, the, the, the people deployed in the field don't necessarily have to be the ones um, uh, building, you know, the, the sophisticated models, but they need to know something exists called AI, called RPA, called, um, you know, uh, um, autonomous systems, whatever it is, right? Exists and I can recognize it and then I can go talk to someone if I see something that looks like an application. When you're going through that, the way we've done, we're designing our programs is we're, when you go out to 50,000 people and you give them awareness training, we're trying to identify the people in that population who are really excited about it, right? And want to take that next step in their career, maybe towards cybersecurity, maybe towards software development, maybe towards you know, data science. Um, and you then get them into you know, step one, which we would think of as kind of like a challenge program where... Um, you train them deeper on that specific technology. Uh, they actually have to do some stuff like some basic coding and see, do they have the grit and the aptitude to, uh, to make it through a more detailed program and the people that pass that you move up into that practitioner level and you get real heavy training, right? And then once you get to be a practitioner at, at, you know, in cybersecurity or cloud or whatever, um, you say, well, now you're just level one as a practitioner. How do we get you to level two and level three? So, you know, once they complete that first intensive training, you want them to get some on, on the job experience. And then you say, okay, great. Let's send you back for that next level, get some more experience and just get you up that ladder. And then at some point you become a leader. And so we have a leadership curriculum that starts with digital transformation for business leaders. And, uh, but then we have it for each, you know, AI for business leaders, cloud for business leaders, things like that, where a business leader needs to think about, um, I run a supply chain management group, but how is um, data science going to change the notion of supply chain management? And how do I get those types of uh, technologies deployed in my area, right? So it's much more of a strategic level. And how do I develop a talent roadmap so I have the right practitioners to deploy those types of skills? So think of it as a pyramid that starts with awareness, moves up into maybe call it fluency, moves up into practitioner and ultimately culminates at the leadership layer. And organizations need to be thinking about all of these. Interesting. And let's let's spend a few minutes on on the, on the nation. I think that the government model that you talked about, I think that's fascinating word as, as I think we were talking before the conversation. So um, true story. So we were we were asked by one one of the one of the government, um, one of the city official saying that Vishal, you know what, and 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 not US one, which is unfortunate. That Vishal, you know what, um, government run on taxes and people pay taxes. If people don't, and jo through jobs, they pay, pay taxes. If people don't make money, they won't pay taxes and governments will go bankrupt, right? So, and we are seeing writing on the wall. So we are seeing that um, people are not getting retrained for this future and emerging workforce. They're getting obsolete workforce all around. How can how can we, and I think uh, one of your experiences is pretty much the same, where government says, okay, there's a huge opportunity right in front of us. They progressively act and, and and did something about it i think what has what has been um 
so one one sort of uh, one one interesting fact that i found uh, pretty interesting in in one of those when, when we were talking to them is they say we shall train all of my workers to be coders right yeah. i said but that's not how that's not how the retraining works some things some people are more close to coding some people are not and if you take two polar uh, and try to match them it will repel instead of instead of attract so when when you deal with um, these challenges of say retraining masses because these are not technical savvy communities you are serving them and 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 delivering success is paramount to you as well because you are a technology transformation uh, platform you need to transform some talent um, so talk to us about how has been your journey so it's really interesting your point that uh like not everyone wants to be a coder and not everyone wants to be a cybersecurity analyst. Uh, so when you're creating these programs, you're going to want to find uh, typically more than one outlet. And so we might launch on a national scale. We might want to launch a digital marketing uh, pr uh, track, uh, launch a software development track, launch an AI and analytics track, um, and then uh let people self-select based on their interests. Uh, so there's multiple different, you know, uh, success paths for um, people entering the programs. Uh, that w that works pretty well. And then you just you you quick you you monitor their progress and um, and figure out not just who has interest but who actually has the tenacity uh, to complete these programs and really you know double down your efforts on those people. So I think there's probably like equally smart ways to do that. Uh, this works pretty well for us, but you know, you could probably use some, um, uh, some data and analytics to, uh, to cluster people, uh, as I think you, uh, um, you know, uh, to, to get the right people in the right cohorts in the right area. And the same is probably true within the, uh, the enterprise is just making sure that, you know, just because Bob is one step from being a data analyst doesn't mean Bob wants to be a data analyst. Maybe Bob wants to be something totally different. And um, and figuring out like how to get the right people in the right programs where they're going to be successful, where they have the right interest, is a is a really key piece of this. And and what is the role of legislature in um, or, or 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 our local congressmen in 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 ensuring? Because I think uh, as a technologist, when I when I it it almost gives me a heartache, right? So when you you don't see this conversation happening in city officials in US or state or or, or federal officials, but every other country is panicking about this right and then you want to somehow be that shining uh, star on the hill so what has what do you think should happen uh, to 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 sort of deliver on this um, uh, in locally here as well i think the us is just completely missing the boat other countries uh, including china are being very very strategic about what, where they're placing their training dollars and how they're developing their workforces. And they're going to be the leaders of the next century. And the US is so backwards looking. Almost all of our dollars go into a university system that is broken, has tripled in cost, and doesn't solve this problem. Uh, what workforce dollars get deployed is some, through something called WIOA. And that's really designed to train welders and is not designed to actually build a tech forward economy and skill set. And when I talk to legislatures, like by and large, uh, uh, legislators, uh, by and large, they are so backwards looking, fighting the, you know, the previous wars in the previous century um, and not thinking about the future. And there's very little, if any, stomach to do anything other than university and training welders. And any innovation that exists would be at the state level or maybe even the local level, which is super, super disconnected and fragmented, which isn't a scalable way to do it. So frankly, like what does the United States need to do? Like we have proposed programs where it's super simple, um, have a lifetime grant of between, you know, three to $5,000 per person that can be deployed based on uh, retraining and reskilling. Uh, tax credits to enterprises for uh, retraining and reskilling short-term programs outside of the calcified university system and the broken WIOA system. It, there's just like, it, I can't tell you how profoundly disappointed I am with the United States in our inability to attack a clear and present 
danger and problem uh, to our global competitiveness. And it's fallen largely on enterprises uh, to uh, to pick up the slack. But, you know, it's, it's, it's really disappointing. Interesting. I think I, I couldn't agree with you more on this. So as a technologist, right? So um, obviously, when government is not picking the tab, hopefully the citizens locally could at some capacity. So I, I'm curious to learn what you as an organ as an organization is doing to play your part in in in, in spreading that. And 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 what do you think other cohorts around you, other organizations who can support could 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 venture in and support in this mission? So. One of the big things we do is give back. And um, we created the Pledge to America's Workers, um, which, where we pledged, uh, you know, over 100,000 scholarships um, in 2020. We also launched our Pledge to Equality, uh, where we've trained um, a large number of uh, African-American students uh, on tech forward skills and really tried to play our part in terms of matching them with uh, job outcomes. And we are partnering with, that's all Udacity funded. We also uh, launched our Women in STEM initiative where we're uh, providing uh, scholarships to women to get them trained in, uh, more women trained in the tech fields. Uh, we put on a huge, uh, two huge conferences, one in the US, one uh, internationally um, uh, with, you know, exclusively uh, presented by women leaders, uh, executives uh, who have, you know, STEM backgrounds. So, um, you know, these are all areas where Udacity is funding, you know, real societal impact. We partner with other organizations like Citibank and Accenture and others to um, provide scholarships. And, and 110 is a great organization and Blacks in Technology and others to provide scholarships to, to specific demographics um, and amplify our efforts. And, uh, and we tend to get like really good success rates. If you think about an organization and almost every global 2000 company has a mandate to give back to a community, right? Um, uh, for societal good. If you think about these programs, they have frankly very few avenues to deploy that capital and see like a real step change impact for their investments. And what we're doing actually provides that measurable impact. We can measure people who graduate, get a new job, get a, promotion, get a higher salary, like that's all trackable and it can be tied back to a real ROI, which has never really exists for these types of organizations before. So um, I'm very, very passionate about our work in uh, the diversity and inclusion space and, um, and, and other organizations can do you know, the same thing and focus on impact uh, and tangible measurable impact. So on, on, on a slight lighter note, so if, a, if there's a parent and who's listening to this, should they be saving on their um, kids' education? <laughs> so I can't answer that for a parent. I think, I think the university degree still has uh, a lot of perceived value among employers. Um, I think they're, I mean, we both went to university, you know, we both got to kind of grow up and, you know, learn some good critical thinking skills. I'm not saying the university system is without merit. I'm just saying that it is way too expensive. It hasn't innovated. Um, and, uh, and they need to rethink their missions and how do you get to more people at lower costs and provide superior outcomes? Um, I wouldn't necessarily advise people to not go to college, but if you have someone who's like a rock star, wants to be a rock star coder and doesn't want to go to college, totally viable, right? And so um, I, I just think university is not the only path anymore. Um, it's, uh, it's a path for a lot of people, but I think we need a lot of other paths for people who just don't want to go through that and uh, or, or can't afford to. It's just ridiculously expensive now. Expensive, yeah. <laughs> uh, I couldn't agree more. So if, if I'm a bis if I'm a um, executive responsible for retraining and developing my workforce and I'm struggling and I'm struggling to to move a ball, um, what would you advise? Uh, talk to Udacity. <laughs> 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 but um, I would say this is totally do doable. Um, we tend to partner with business unit leaders because they have the most pain. Mm -hmm. um, and, and learning and development teams, there, there are some learning and development teams we work with that are really forward thinking. Many of them haven't made the intellectual leap 
of going from how do I deploy compliance training and administer college reimbursement into how do I tr- how do I really understand the business critical needs of my organization and build structural systematic learning programs around it. So number one, I'd say get serious about human capital and get serious about learning development as a transformation agent. That will take years, right? And in the meantime, partner with your business unit leaders and make this a real system, make it a mandate and make it a real systematic approach. Take a programmatic approach to it um, and, uh, and put real resourcing and project plans around it and, uh, and, drive, and tie it to specific outcomes and measure it because you're going to have to build that muscle internally. The talent just doesn't exist externally anymore. You have no choice, so you need to, to get ahead of it. Awesome. Uh, thank you for thank you for for sharing the, your point of view on that. So now let's do the let's move to the next segment and and um, we call it a rapid fire. So basically, how that works is um, I I go I say something and tell me first thing that comes to your mind, and you're more than welcome to elaborate more if you if you wish to. And um, should we start? Let's do it. Awesome. Future of work. Um, the future of work. Uh, is is digital and people have the wrong skills. Technology. Exponential change. I think the last 20 years have been unlike anything in the history of the world, including the Industrial Revolution, and it's just accelerating. Uh, leadership. Um, vision and inspiration over control and direction. Remote work. Be deliberate. Uh, know what's what it's good for and what it's not, and design around that. I think that we get our thinking caught in the binary: I want to be back in the office or I want to be fully remote. And I think the reality of the future is somewhere in the middle. But making sure those times when you are in the office, you're super deliberate about why you're in the office and what you want to get out of it, whether it's solving a hard problem, whether it's um, uh, creative problem solving, whether it's uh, team building or um, or just social, like be deliberate about it uh, and 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 think about like what is effective versus binary A or B. Awesome. Uh, equity. There are major uh, inequities still, especially in tech. Women comprise 26 percent of the tech workforce. Uh, and they are nearly 50% of the total workforce. So we have a lot of work to do to make sure uh, we have broad representation in these future forward jobs and skills. Um, people are paid uh, fairly. Um, and, you know, as one ex- example of this, um, you know, we have run scholarship programs in Saudi Arabia. Two thirds of our recipients are, are women. So we're helping build a female um tech economy and you know a country that you know didn't really have that before um, on that i i I'd love to know one point of view uh, so as, as a platform uh, that delivers um uh, these training platforms um capabilities so confidence right so sure you can train someone to do certain things um but i think in many areas uh, many of these diversity candidates or diversity portfolios they require more help so when you deliver on technology, um, how do you ensure, uh, I, I'm curious, like, how do you ensure that they end up like the other other segments that are critical for success are also delivered? It's a really important point. It's not just um, providing the technical training. Uh, it's providing the social support structures around it. Um, so in these programs, we will... The programs are, are often custom built, you know, based on this specific situation. Um, but we will have um, community sessions built in for their peers to work with their peers and to s- support each other. We'll have sessions built in, you know, uh, live um, uh, sessions with, uh, uh, you know, session leaders who will help them think about, you know, how do you actually land a, a job or develop your um, your confidence in interview skills or develop your freelancing skills or you know it's, it's one thing to learn how to do something like coding it's another thing to actually go out and get a job and it's another thing to work with others around you 
uh, to help you through the hard times. And so it, it really is about that supported journey. Um, thank you. Um, diversity. Um, tech companies have totally failed on you know, building a diverse workforce. African-Americans represent 3% of Silicon uh, Valley tech company employees are 13% of the total uh, workforce. And um, we need to go beyond just um, you know, lip service, service and hoping for the best to actually doing something about it. Our partnership with 110 is one great example uh, of things we can tangibly do to increase uh, the available population of talented um, uh, minority workers. And, uh, and we just got to stop um, putting our resources and our lip service where it's not effective and start putting it where it is effective. Interesting. Uh, le legislature. Completely ineffective, stuck in old ideas, fighting battles from the past and not the future. Uh, pretty harsh there. <laughs> but it's true. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's true. Uh, jobs of future. Uh, machine learning, cloud, autonomous systems, cybersecurity. Uh, future of learning. Uh, the future of learning is smaller chunks, um, uh, tech forward, um, and employable. Things that keep you up at night. Our inability in the United States to have a civil conversation about differing ideas across the political aisle. Fair point. Uh, that's that's uh, well put. So thank you for playing that, and 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 thank you for uh, for bearing through this. Now let's let's uh, talk quickly about your personal journey. Right. So okay. uh, we ask all of our guests to share um, s some qualities that has really helped them shape what they have become. Like, what are some of those qualities that has helped you be what you are today? Yeah. Great. Um, I'd say, like, you know, three things that come to mind uh, that I've kind of lived by is number one, be curious. Don't just do what's asked. Ask yourself, like, what is the right question? And, you know, what big problems can I solve? So just really dig in and be curious with everything. The second is when in doubt, do what's right. And the rewards will eventually follow, right? So don't just run towards your bonus, but run towards what's right for the business um, and everything else will catch up. And then the final thing is don't accept failure. Keep fighting. Be tenacious. Have grit. Don't give up. Uh, thank you for, for sharing that. Uh, and now, um, some, some of your favorite reads. So we ask all of our guests to share some of the some of the books that, that 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 has really helped shape their point of view or or they're currently reading so are there any yeah. some books that you can share for our listeners and viewers i love no rules rules by reed hastings who's the ceo of netflix they have built a really singular culture and it's a culture built around talent and when you have what you know what he calls talent density which is when you look around the room and everyone is like at the top of their game uh, and performing that way, you don't actually need rules, right? Because they have judgment and they can make decisions and it's completely freeing and liberating as an organization. Um, and so uh, I read that book and I probably, you know, had already developed about 70% of the ideas in my kind of personal style, um, but he, got, he helped push my thinking and really solidify, you know, talent as a strategy. Awesome. Uh, thank you for sharing that. So last but not the, not the least. So uh, if you want some uh, thing that our listeners and viewers can take away from this conversation, what would that be? Like, what would be your parting thought? So it's really simple. Our workforce is going through the most insane transformation um, in the history of the world. Companies, as a result, are facing huge talent and skills shortages. There literally are millions of unfilled and unfillable roles in digital jobs because the workers just aren't there. Those companies and those nations that fail to procure the right high skill digital talent will fail. 50% of the Fortune 500 no longer exists, largely due to uh, digital transformation or failing there. 
companies like BlackBerry, Kodak, Blockbuster, and others. The companies that actually navigate this well, who effectively transform their talent in their organization to leading edge digital skills, they are going to be the leaders of the next century. And the choice is yours. Do you want to go the way of Blockbuster or do you want to go the way of Netflix? Well put, I think. Gabe, thank you so much. Thank you so much for, for, for being generous with your time and, and helping us understand um, what's happening in the world of uh, training and re-education. And, and, and I could not agree more with you that um, like Radical Talent Transformation Platform is much needed and we should have almost, I should say everyone should tra- like turn their face into and be more responsive of how they are actually impacting the, uh, the end result, how they are, instead of, as you rightly said, cutting, pasting and putting a lot of content out there and having people chew it, how are you making sure that actually it's making an impact? And thank you for playing your part in, in reintroducing the workforce today. Awesome. And uh, thank you for having me and uh, really appreciated the, all the great conversation and all the great questions and uh, and look forward to connecting uh, you know, personally as we, we collaborate on how we can figure out how to use clusters to more intelligently target learning populations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>